Well, hello everyone again. I am uh, I'm Bill Johnson. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, I represent the sixth congressional district of the great state of Ohio. Uh, and I am so very proud to be a co-chair of the UXO uh, Demining Caucus again, this session of Congress, along with my colleague, Congresswoman Jackie Speer. As you may all know, Afghanistan is one of the highest, has one of the highest levels of landmine and explosive contamination in the world, a result of over 40 years of war. You may also know that the US government has been the leading supporter of humanitarian mine clearance in Afghanistan for nearly two decades. And as the US alters our military approach to Afghanistan, I believe it's essential that we continue to provide needed humanitarian assistance to support stabilization. The demining sector in Afghanistan has cleared over 273,000 acres of landmines and explosives, has destroyed over 855,000 landmines and over 18 million other items of unexploded ordnance. However, there remains over 123,000 acres that must be cleared. And that endeavor could unfortunately take many years. In addition to saving lives and restoring livelihoods, the demining sector has the capacity to bolster peace and prevent backsliding by providing stable employment to thousands of currently unemployed Afghan <laughs> police. And as the peace process moves forward, demobilized ex-combatants. I'm very appreciative of the HALO Trust and other organizations on the ground in Afghanistan. I've personally visited one of HALO Trust demining sites in a northeast province of Sri Lanka back in 2017. I visited one of the HALO Trust demining sites in a northeast province of Sri Lanka back in 2017, uh, which has worked to clear over 300,000 mines and unexploded ordinances. What a humbling experience. I saw firsthand the painstaking experience, uh, the work that it takes to clear these lands so that displaced persons are finally safely able to return home. Uh, and and uh, most of the time it was, uh, it was uh, women, young and old, uh, because their husbands, their sons had either been uh, killed or displaced in the conflict and so it was up to them to work with Halo Trust to, uh, to, uh, to uncover and dispose of those uh, landmines and other ex unexploded ordinances that, uh, that riddled their, their property. They couldn't get back into their homes and occupy their, uh, their property until that work was done. And while each country has unique challenges, the opportunity to bring stability, humanitarian assistance, and enable the safe return of contaminated lands to its local populations uh, is vitally important everywhere, not only in Afghanistan, but, but everywhere where we have this demining problem. So thank you again for reviewing, uh, uh, for viewing today's important briefing. Additionally, if you or your member of Congress is, in, is interested in joining the caucus, please reach out to Laura Wilson on my staff or Kate Adams with Representative Spear. Uh, I know we have a number of staff that's, uh, that's on this uh, uh, Zoom session today. So if your member is interested in joining the caucus, we would welcome that. The more attention we have on this area, the more, uh, the more progress we make. Um, let me now uh, begin to introduce today's esteemed panel. First, we'll hear from Dr. Farid uh, Homayun, the country director and program manager for the HALO Trust in Afghanistan. Dr. Homayun is a medical doctor from Kabul. He joined HALO in 1988 when the organization first began and has been running HALO Afghanistan as program manager since 1995. With a workforce of over 2,000, Halo Afghanistan currently conducts life-saving mine action operations in all 34 provinces across the country, clearing legacy landmines, explosive remnants of war, and abandoned improvised mines. 
Halo Afghanistan provides a 24 seven call out service for communities, for NGOs and Afghan national security forces responding to requests to, uh, to dispose of dangerous explosive items. In addition, Halo Afghanistan conducts countrywide surveys to identify hazardous areas and provides risk education. Thank you, Dr. Farid, for joining us today from Afghanistan. I'll call on you just a second for your remarks. Let me introduce the rest of our panel. Uh, next, we're fortunate to hear from Her Excellency Roya Romani, Afghanistan's first female ambassador to the United States. Welcome, Madam Ambassador. She is also non-resident ambassador to Argentina, Mexico, the Dominican Republic, and Colombia. Previously, she served as Afghanistan's first female ambassador to Indonesia and was the country's first accredited ambassador to the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission awarded uh, Ambassador Romani the Best Human Rights Activist Award in 2010, and Indonesia Tatler named her the People's Ambassador in 2017. In 2019, she was featured on Time Magazine's 100 Next list as a fierce advocate of peace on Afghan terms. She has a bachelor's degree in software engineering from McGill University and a master's degree in public administration from Columbia University. Madam Ambassador, we need to have a personal conversation sometime. I'm a software engineer as well. And so if, if I could make a living programming in ones and zeros, that's what I would do. But computer systems and networks don't work that way anymore. So there's not much of a market for that. But I, I'd look forward to hearing more of your background. She is the mother of a young daughter and often speaks passionately about the importance of bringing women and youth into the democratic process. Uh, Madam Ambassador, thank you for joining us today and I'll call on you uh, shortly for your presentation as well. Next, we will hear from Dr. Stanley Brown, Acting Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary and the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Programs and Operations in the Bureau of political military affairs. He is responsible for programs that strengthen US national security by preventing illicit proliferation of small arms and light weapons, including manned portable air defense systems. He, um, uh, he guides and directs peacekeeping policy and programs to augment the global capacity to respond to peacekeeping operations worldwide and provides overall direction for global security assistance programs, seeking to build the capacity of and professionalize uh, our, our efforts with our security partners. He previously served as the director of the Office of Weapons Removal and Abatement in the PM Bureau from July 2013 to January 2020. It's nice to see you again, Mr. Brown. Thank you for joining us today. And with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Farid for your uh, opening comments. And, uh, and then we'll go to our other panelists before we begin taking questions. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency Ambassador Roya Rahmani, and Mr. Stan Brown, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Programs and Operations, Congre Congresswoman Ms. Jackie Spear, Congressman Mr. Bill Johnson. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a good morning to you, uh, UK, uh, US time. Uh, for me, this is a great pleasure and honor for me to attend today's uh, UXOD Mining Caucus event uh, on advancing security and stability in Afghanistan. And thank you for inviting me and for the opportunity to be one of the panelists today in today's great, uh, great event. Uh, first, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the US government and particularly PMWRA and the American people for their very generous support to the Mine Action Program of Afghanistan and particularly to the Halo Trust since 1999. It's almost, it's over 20 years of assistance to the Mine Action Program. Can I have slide number, uh, the first slide, please? Um, share on the screen. We have it. So uh, I would like to cover a couple of uh, uh, topics uh, in my today's presentation. Um, the first one I would like to, to, talk, to cover is about the mine in UXO contamination in Afghanistan. And I would like my colleagues to 
present slide number three and four, if possible, to share the screen. Um, so I would like to give you a little bit of background on the history of uh, conflict in Afghanistan that probably you are all aware of this. You know, Afghanistan has been suffering from a long and protracted conflict. This conflict started in April 1978 by the communist coup organized by a group of Afghan army officers backed by the Soviet Union, which uh, they have violently overthrew the first Afghanistan Republic under President uh, Sardar Mohammad Daoud. This followed by the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan on Christmas Eve of 1979, which led to the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan for 10 years. And the Soviet Red Army, after their defeat in Afghanistan in 1989, they left behind the communist regime of late President Najibullah and his communist party, known as PDPA or People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan. And his regime was thrown out of power in April 1992 by a loose alliance of various Mujahideen groups based in Pakistan and Iran, backed by the, uh, some regional powers, some Gulf states and some Western countries. The Mujahideen government did not last long and after a period of civil war and interfactional fighting, the Taliban Islamic movement has seized power in Afghanistan in August, 1996. And they have established the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan known as the IEA. The IEA rule, rule ended in the, after the coalition invasion of Afghanistan after the tragic events of 9-11 and a democratically elected government came to power uh, in Afghanistan, which is recognized and supported by the international community. So the reason I give you this kind of overview of the recent conflict, history of con conflict in Afghanistan is the history of mine laying going, is going hand in hand with the, uh, with the history of conflict in Afghanistan. So basically mines and unexploded ordnance or UXO were used in three sessions in Afghanistan. The first session was uh, mines and UXO were used and laid by the Soviets and their, um, uh, uh, so, and Dr. Najibullah's regime. So I'm talking about 1980s to 1992. The second session of mine laying was done by Mujahideen groups during the interfactional fightings in between 92 and 95. And the third session during the conflict between the Taliban and the Northern Alliance from 1995 to year 2000. And um, so when we talk about mine laying, we're also talking about the contamination of the country with unexploded ordnance known as ERW. So unfortunately, all these kind of the, the con various stages of conflict lettered Afghanistan with mines and unexploded ordnance and Afghanistan has become one of the worst affected countries by landmines and other types of explosive remnants of war. And according to recorded uh, statistics by the the Directorate of Mine Action Coordination, there's over a 1,500 square kilometer of legacy and new contamination across the country in over 4,000 hazardous areas. And so this is uh, affecting the lives and livelihoods of millions of Afghans. I mean, the impact of this uh, deadly legacy is on civilian population. And unfortunately, you know, for example, last year between January to December, um, 2020, I would like to uh, ask my colleagues to put slides number five and number six um, yeah, on the screen, please, if possible. Uh, there were over 1,363 civilian casualties in Afghanistan recorded. And 62% uh, of these casualties were because of, let's say, homemade mines or victim-operated IEDs known as AIM or abandoned improvised mines. So you can see the very high, the, the, the highest figure of casualties are, are caused because of abandoned improvised mines used by the insurgent groups in Afghanistan. So this is the, the second point I would like to cover. It's been covered by the by a congressman as well is about a little bit of Halo, Halo's work in Afghanistan. As we established in 1988 when the Soviets were still in Afghanistan. And at the moment, the Halo Trust is the largest mine clearance organization in Afghanistan with over 2,000 multi-ethnic workforce. And uh, as the Congressman said, we are operational in all 34 provinces of Afghanistan. We provide life-saving clearance of minefields, battlefields, clearance of abandoned improvised mines, and other types of explosive remnants of war. And we provide explosive risk education to men, women, boys, and girls using mixed gender teams. As the Congressman said, we are also providing a, like an EUD explosive ordinance 
call out service, which is operational 24 hours, seven day a week. And uh, on average, we are responding to 150 EOD call outs each month, each month, providing assistance to communities, to NGOs, to Afghan national security forces and, uh, um, and, and uh, NGOs. Uh, we also we are involved in uh, uh, recruiting women and use and uh, uh, employing women as uh, not as deminers but in mainly in uh, explosive risk education activities also in uh, survey and non technical survey. If I can ask my colleague to put slide number two. Um, generally, we use in Afghanistan uh, uh, the mahram structure. Uh, Madam Ambassador will notice that. Uh, you know, in Afghanistan, especially in the mining sector, it's not possible to recruit just uh, women. You have to recruit the mahram, which means father and daughter and husband and wife, brother and sister. So that's the way we are addressing the issue of gender in mine action and um, providing jobs to two members of the same family for the, uh, because we want more women to play a more active role uh, in, in the mining sector. And we have made a gender roadmap to uh, maximize the role of women in mine action, and we uh, and we will be increasing our recruitment of women to over 100% uh, this year and the year to come. Um, we're also we are Halo Trust is the only organization involved in clearance of abandoned improvised mines or victim operated IEDs left behind uh, by the Taliban and Daesh in South and Eastern Afghanistan. So what opportunities are there? Because the, the topic of this. Uh, of this webinar is about peace and reintegration and what role mine action can play to employ ex-combatants uh, in the mining sector. I would like to touch base on a couple of points. First of all, mine action, it's a natural fit to find, to uh, uh, offer to the, the, the former fighters. Why? Because, uh, because of humanitarian nature of mine clearance and the credibility of the mine action sector, uh, well respected by all parties involved in the con conflict and uh, you know, and Halo has over 30 years of track record of humanitarian work, and we conduct our operation in all parts of the country. And in case of Afghan, Af uh, mine action, it's primarily run by the Afghans, led by the Afghans. So it's kind of in mine action is generally a, a national national entity and has the confidence of the Afghan people. The ability of the mine action to work in conflict areas. So we are able to get consent and access of communities and we are able to work in the areas controlled by the Afghan government or the Taliban control areas. And that's the key things for, for us, getting consent and access to hard to reach areas. We're also providing jobs. This is a very important uh, point in the mine action because in, in Afghanistan, I believe insurgency is driven and fueled by poverty. It's not an ideological war. And I think you know, mine action uh, play a very important role in security and stability of communities. Of course, security is achieved through clearance of landmines and other explosive remnants of war. And um, but stability is provided by recruiting these young men of fighting age. These young men of fighting age in the countryside are the firewood of insurgency. So by providing dignified jobs to to these people, you're actually stopping the cycle of violence. The ethnic diversity of the mine action is another important thing. As we know in Afghanistan, uh, Pashtuns, Tajiks, Hazara, Uzbeks, all main ethnic groups are like, you know, they are working in the mine action se sector. And the, our workforce is really multi-ethnic and we can work in any part of the country. Um, if I can ask my colleague to put slide number seven. Um, the other important thing I'd like to touch base is our involvement in peace and reintegration program known as APRP. The Halo Trust in 2000, during 2011, 2012, we were involved working with Afghanistan High Peace, Peace Council, HPC. We were uh, working uh, together uh, under the Afghanistan Peace and Reintegration Pro Program and we provided, uh, we have recruited over 260 former Taliban and Hezbo Islami fighters and, pro and provided them with meaningful and dignified jobs. A lot of these people are still working with, for Halo as the miners. And the last but not the least, uh, at the last slide, if you can put slide number eight, is the future role of the mine action. I mean, basically, if inshallah the peace uh, process goes well, and there's ultimately a peace uh, in Afghanistan, which I believe there will be, and mine action can play a crucial role 
in the aftermath of a peace agreement between the government and the, the, the Taliban, the IEA, and we can actually uh, provide, potentially recruit thousands of demobilized uh, fighters as humanitarian deminers. Um, so that's briefly about, about, uh, about uh, my presentation, and I'll be taking any questions later on. Thank you very much. Congressman Johnson had to step away briefly. Um, next, we'd like to have Madam Ambassador give your remarks. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Assalamu alaikum. May peace be upon you. The topic that we are discussing today is grave indeed, but it is, it lightens my heart to see so many of you here today to learn more about this very critical issue so that hopefully we can move forward in making Afghanistan safer and more prosperous together. Thanks to you and uh, for your attention. In particular, I would like to thank Congresswoman Jackie Spear uh, for her invitation to join today's session and her powerful le leadership as uh, well as Congressman Bill Johnson. I completely agree and echo, uh, and that makes the two of us that I could not uh, make a living with the zeros and ones of the software engineering, and we need to discuss that in person, I hope, sometime soon. Uh, thank you all, uh, the caucus members, for their uh, commitment to bringing a powerful impact uh, of demining work in countries all around the world into the spotlight. And especially, I uh, also like to thank all the staffers, policymakers, change makers present today who are working tirelessly on these issues. Last but not least, I would like to recognize my fellow panelists, Deputy Assistant Secretary Stan Brown uh, and Dr. Farid Homayoun. Uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Brown, thank you for your support of these critical demining programs and Dr. Humayun, you are a credit to Afghanistan. I am told that you were uh, one of the first HALO demining staff members uh, in Afghanistan. And now you lead a team of 2,500 Afghans who work every day, mine to mine, create a brighter future and safer future for our country. I thank you for all what you do. The labor and dedication of all these hardworking people, Afghans, Americans, and international allies has had an enormous impact. The estimated 18 million mines removed since 1989 is a testament to that. But there is still much work left to do. In 2020, as uh, Mr. Habayoun mentioned, Afghanistan had one of the highest landmine casualty rates in the world, with well more than uh, 100 Afghan civilians losing their lives or being injured one way or another with these uh, unexplosive ordnance. The mountains that we have, we have to climb are high, and the path is dangerous. There are millions of mines still endangering Afghans' lives every day. 33 out of 34 provinces are contaminated by mines and an explosive ordinance. And an estimated 2.5 uh, million Afghans live within one kilometer of contaminated land. The most frequent victim of explosives remnants of war are children comprising 78% of casualties in 2019. The thousands of children who have been killed and injured by mines or unexplosive ordnance during our last 40 years of war have been robbed of their childhood and the full potential of their future. But the consequence of uh, ERW's extent beyond physical injuries. Although they are far less likely to be directly hurt by mines, women are heavily affected by the secondhand effects of mines and unexplosive ordnance. 
women are as the primary as the primary caregivers or almost the ones in charge of caring for children and other family members who have been disabled in mining incidents. They can be further disadvantaged as they struggle to make for the loss of income from injured family members. Globally, households with, the, uh, with a, line, a landmine victim were 40% more likely to have difficulty providing food for their families. The macroeconomy is also held back by mine contamination. Infrastructure is repeatedly damaged and invaluable road cannot be accessed. Furthermore, our agricultural production has been dramatically curtailed since much of Afghanistan's farmland is not safe. In 2001, it was estimated that agricultural production could be increased by 88 to 200 percent in Afghanistan if landmines were eradicated. These horrifying statistics demonstrate not only how critical the mining is, but how urgently it must be undertaken. The Afghan government and its international partners have already made great strides. The United States, the United Nations, and other allies have cleared more than 18.6 million items of uh, uh, ERW and at one point was able to reduce the casualty rate from mines by 50% during a three year period. As a result of these efforts, more than 1.5 million displaced Afghan have been able to return to their homes. The mining also presents unprecedented economic opportunities. The, the mining sector currently employs thousands of Afghans and with all that uh, still needs to be done before Afghanistan can be declared mine free, the field can expand exponentially. As Dr. Amayun also made reference, by hiring people in dignified jobs, we can prevent them from joining the combatants and insurgents. Economic benefits have been proven, proven historically. Cleared land has enabled employment opportunities for estimated 10,000 or more farmers and industrial workers. Increasing agricultural output and livestock production by dozens of millions of dollars. Benefits expand far beyond the mining sector. Mines and unexploded ordnance block roads and trade routes, denying communities access to the rest of their country, schools, clinics, and other essential services. A demined Afghanistan is a connected Afghanistan. As Afghan women claim space throughout the public sphere, they have even taken an extremely untraditional role in the demining sector. The UN Mine Action Services has already trained 16 women in Bamiyan in demining. This incredible group of women released 51,520 square meters of ERWs affected land back to their community in Bamiyan province. Many of them continued to work as the miners and contributed to clearing the last known minefield in Bamiyan in 2019. However, our efforts towards creating a mine-free Afghanistan are being undermined. The Taliban and other extremist group, uh, organizations continue to target civilians with these weapons. As violence has intensified since 2014, so has Taliban's use of IEDs, sticky bombs, and other deadly explosives. As a result, the country has seen a drastic increase in civilian landmine casualties. In 2012, 36 civilians were killed or injured by a landmine each month. By 2017, the number increased to more than 150. The Afghan government remains fully committed to international law and its landmine ban. 
Moreover, they are dedicated to seeing an Afghanistan where mothers can allow their children to run and explore freely without fearing mines, where we do not lose over 100 Afghans to ERWs each month. In 2011, our government committed to clearing the country's known minefields by 2023. Unfortunately, despite our notable progress in recent years, we have been unable to reach our annual benchmarks due to the reduced funding and intensified violence. Over the past nine years, funding has dropped to 26% of its initial investments. As funding has progressively decreased each year, so has our ability to demine. Afghanistan's need uh, needs to continue the continued support of international community, especially its closest partners, the United States, to meet its international obligation and address new threats to civilians. The mining efforts are crucial for the future of Afghanistan. The 40,000 ERW casualties Afghanistan has experienced since 1979 is unacceptable. War is always horrific, but the use of weapons that primarily affect the most vulnerable, playing children, farmers trying to make a living, civilians fleeing conflict is a, 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 a abominable issue. We must reverse this humanitarian disaster. Together, I know we can. I thank you all. Well, thank you, Madam Ambassador. Very, uh, very much appreciate those comments. Uh, and we will get together and talk uh, uh, software engineering when the opportunity presents. I hope it's soon. Uh, Mr. Brown, over to you. Uh, good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. Thank you, uh, uh, Congressman Johnson, for chairing this and pulling us together. Uh, great to see our my panelists, uh, Dr. Free Hamion and uh, Ambassador Ramani. Uh, thank you for being here today and talking so passionately about this issue and looking forward to hearing from Congresswoman Spear uh, as we proceed. So it's a pleasure to be with you today. My name is uh, Stan Brown. I serve as the Acting Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of Political Military Affairs at the Department of State. Uh, in this capacity, I oversee the Bureau's Conventional Weapons Assistance Programs, or CWD is kind of what we call it. Uh, humanitarian demining has particular interest for me because uh, prior to my current role, I served as the Director of the Office of Weapons Remo Removal and Abatement, uh, which oversaw and, and continues to oversee the CWD assistance programs around the world. The United States is uh, committed to reducing landmine and explosive contamination threats worldwide, and it's the leading financial support of these efforts having provided more than $3.8 in assistance to more than 100 countries since 1993. Historically, Afghanistan has been a major beneficiary of, of CWD assistance, having received over $515 million since 1993 to clear landmines and explosive remnants of war, as well as identify uh, secure and as appropriate, destroy stockpiles of uh, weapons and ammunition that are at risk of falling into the wrong hands. Uh, with the help of the UN, uh, the Mine Action Program for Afghanistan was established in 1998 and is the oldest, most mature mine action program in the world. U.S. support for this program specifically focuses on protecting victims of conflict, providing life-saving humanitarian assistance, and enhancing the security and safety of the Afghan people. Uh, this is uh, critical because poorly secured uh, conventional weapons, uh, stockpiles and explosive remnants of war both threaten civilians. They enable insurgents, insurgent related violence. They impede economic opportunity and it undermines uh, political stability. So now the threats that uh, poorly secure uh, weapon stockpiles uh, pose to civilian security and political stability are obvious. But it's also important to keep in mind that landmine and UXO contamination creates larger problems than the immediate threat of physical harm to individuals. Wherever landmine and UXO contamination is suspected to exist, it can close vast tracts of land to human activity. In countries that are heavily dependent on agriculture, such as Afghanistan, this has a devastating effect on local economies since it denies people their primary means of securing their livelihoods. And when people are denied productive economic opportunity, they find themselves vulnerable to 
radicalization and drawn to joining uh, destabilizing actors. US CW, uh, uh, CWD assistance addresses these challenges with two main lines of effort. Uh, first, uh, we want to work with host nation authorities to identify, secure, and eliminate stockpiles of weapons and ammunition at risk of uh, exploitation by terrorists and other destabilizing actors. Uh, second, uh, we support clearance of landmines, unexploded ordnance, and other explosive remnants of war that threatens uh, civilian communities, education for local populations to uh, teach them how to stay safe while living in proximity to explosive hazards, and assistance for landmine and UXO survivors, such as prosthetics and vocational training. Uh, these projects enhance stability by denying weapons to terrorists and insurgents, uh, creating new economic opportunity by opening vast swaths of land to agricultural activity, and providing local populations with a more productive alternative for channeling their energies. Generally speaking, uh, prosperous communities are also safe and stable communities and U.S. Uh, conventional weapons destruction assistance helps create the preconditions necessi necessary to support uh, prosperity. Furthermore, uh, this work also allows for the safe return of internally displaced people, IDPs, uh, and also refugees throughout Afghanistan and neighboring countries contributing to stability uh, throughout the region. Central to our program is uh, supporting the development of sustainable national capacities uh, that are equipped to handle landmine and explosive contamination threats in the long term. For this end, we are committed to training, developing, equipping, and supporting Afghanistan's national institutions to secure weapons and ammunition more effectively and to find and clear landmine contamination comprehensively. Of course, none of this would be possible without our outstanding uh, implementing partners, such as the HALO Trust, and I'm incredibly proud of our collective accomplishments over the years. All told, U.S. conventional uh, weapons destruction assistance has facilitated clearance of more than 299 square kilometers, about 185 square miles of land. Uh, as part of that uh, clearance, we removed or destroyed over uh, 8.4 million landmines and other explosive items, there, uh, thereby uh, ensuring that they are no longer a threat to local civilians. Uh, Afghanistan still faces uh, significant challenges though, and despite our progress to date, it still remains heavily contaminated with uh, landmines and unexploded ordnance. However, the United States is committed to supporting their efforts uh, to become free from the impact of landmines and explosive contamination. So uh, thank you uh, so much for your time today. Thank you so much for the panel. And I look uh, forward uh, to further discussion on this important topic and questions. Thank well, you. thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Brown. I appreciate your, your comments. And we're going to open it up now for questions. And I think, Kate, you are, uh, you're running that part of the, uh, today's presentation. Thank you, Congressman. And thank you to all of our panelists um, for your time today. Rep. Spear had hoped to join, but unfortunately, she's caught up in committee right now. Um, but she does send her regrets. Um, for the attendees, just a reminder that you can uh, put your questions into the Q&A box below, and we'll try to get to every question. Uh, to start off, I have a question for Dr. Homeyun. Um, uh, doctor, you, can you elaborate a bit more on how HALO employs women uh, in the divining uh, sector in Afghanistan and, and how you're using sort of culturally sensitive um, ways in your future efforts to increase the number of women uh, in your program? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Kate. I think, as we all know, uh, it's uh, demining is not a sector that women are naturally interested in, at least in Afghanistan, because of the of the nature of the work and because of the remoteness of demining, living in the in the sort of tinted camps in very remote areas. But but there but of course there is there are roles uh, roles that uh, women can play and and will play. For example working as IETs, working in the survey, for example, non-technical survey, working as in risk education teams. And the way we are addressing, as I said earlier, is we are recruiting a, a mahram structure, like, uh, as I said, husband and wife, brother and sister, father and daughter. And, and that, that way we are addressing the gender issue. But also this year, for the first time, we trained some uh, women in a, a non-technical survey. This is like a non-invasive kind of uh, procedure. You go and collect information about the existing of hazardous areas and they are 
you know, you're recording on a map and, uh, and for the first time we introduced women as team leaders and there are a couple of teams now led by, by women and we are taking another step forward to train them in explosive ordnance disposal. Still, there's a, there's a lot of work to do. We are working with the sector, with the national authorities, and hopefully we will find places in Afghanistan, like uh, uh, Madam Ambassador said, uh, you know, that we can train women as deminers. So we have in the sector is taking huge steps to address this issue, but this is not enough. You know, we it's a long, a long way, a long journey to 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 do. Thank you. Thank you. And we have another question coming in. Are there any discussions between HALO and the Taliban to diminish their use of IEDs, which uh, are increasingly um, causing the most contamination and casualties? Um, and if yes, are they open to the idea of using fewer IEDs? Sorry, let me explain this that, you know, we, we have no discussion with the Taliban on, on, on these issues, uh, on the claims of IEDs. But, you know, the key thing is the word abandoned improvised mines or victim operated IEDs. We are not doing a count, we are not involved in counter IED. What is happening is in areas where there is no conflict and the front lines shifted, and these become like legacy contamination, these IEDs. And it's like killing civilians, and there's like agreement by all stakeholders, including the Taliban, to remove these items. That's why the sector, the mine action sector, came with this word. Aim abandoned improvised mines uh, or victim operated IEDs. So we're only dealing with those only if there's there's consent by all stakeholders, the community, the government forces, the Taliban, and then there we we are work. So at the moment the work is limited. Hopefully more and more areas will open up, and uh, we are in a position to to discuss with all stakeholders involved. But this issue has not been addressed uh, countrywide because of the ongoing conflict. Thank you. And then a follow-up for DAS Brown on the same topic. Um, what is the impact of uh, IEDs on civilians in Afghanistan in particular? Um, and does state have um, any particular efforts to address these hazards um, or more plans to do so in the future? Uh, from a State Department perspective, we are looking at trying to cl uh, clear uh, all explosive remnants of war uh, that comes in many forms, uh, so, um, very much so in the improvised uh, landmines or IEDs uh, specifically uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, I know that uh, Dr. Freed, uh, as they're discussing mapping out what the problems are in Afghanistan, in Afghanistan, those issues are taken into account. Um, we are not currently uh, working in Taliban areas or working directly with the Taliban, although the effort of community-based mining helps point to the hazards in Afghanistan, and Dr. Free could talk more about that. But uh, the uh, working with the communities, we are identifying the explosive hazards and removing them as appropriate. Thank you. Um... And then Ambassador uh, Romani, um, I know you've been such an advocate for uh, women and girls in Afghanistan and protecting the gains that they've made uh, since the fall of the Taliban. Um, and we're just so appreciative of your advocacy. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about how the instability um, in Afghanistan and including the danger of, of mine contamination uh, around the country um, particularly impacts women and, and children? Thank you. Uh, of course, all citizens of Afghanistan are suffering from the ongoing conflict and women even more so because they are seen uh, factors or uh, the, the usual um, impact of the war that is being felt and experienced by all the citizens, but then there is additional ones on part of women. Um, some of which I just named during my remarks. For example, uh, as uh, we noted both in uh, Mr. Mayun's presentation that women and girls are less impacted directly by the landmines because there is a reason for it. They are not going out to play. As children, they are not out in the field to play because they are more uh, contained in the uh, 
uh, uh, private sphere or they, and, uh, from a very early age, they, they start taking up or sharing the burden of the household work or even in the agricultural setting, uh, contributing to the labor and uh, whatnot. So, but then any members of the family that gets injured, is it, it becomes their responsibility. In addition that uh, when um, their husbands or brothers or fathers uh, are being uh, injured uh, or killed by these mines, that they lose the, the breadwinner, the income uh, that supports their family, they are also charged uh, by the responsibility of caregiving. And in terms of war and contamination of mines and everything in general, it is further restricting their mobility to uh, access um, education, healthcare, employment, you name it. It, it uh, imposes uh, additional uh, restrictions uh, in terms of what the, uh, the opportunities that, that would have an impact in their, in their future in, in, uh, for their own progress and potentials that they, they can seek. So uh, the, and, and then there is also another phenomena that always uh, when the situation gets tense, when there is crisis, violence against women at the domestic level increases. And then um, uh, we, we have even seen uh, instances of that, uh, and, and um, there is already data uh, being gathered uh, since COVID uh, has appeared. Globally, violence against women has increased significantly since the um, onset of COVID. So uh, definitely women are being, um, affected not only by the direct implication of war and mining, but there is uh, multiple folds on, and many other additional ways that is not necessarily there uh, and collected. Thank you. It's a very concerning and challenging issue, of course. Um, this next question, I think, Maybe best directed to Congressman Johnson. Uh, what can congressional staff members do to support these efforts? Well, I, I think um, uh, Mr. Brown uh, noted on some of it, and my comments noted that as well. I think continuing to um, uh, to bring focus to these issues and and helping people, um, uh, decision makers at all levels of the federal government understand uh, the role that we play and how important it is that America uh, play a leading role in, uh, in funding these things. That's, that's humanitarian assistance. Uh, and and that's, that's what America is known for. Uh, we, have been, uh, we have been leading the charge on appropriations. Um, uh, I know that uh, uh, I led the letter uh, uh, and, and we'll be leading letters to our appropriators again this year, this cycle, uh, to make sure that we have money set aside uh, for our contribution. But we also need to work with our friends and allies across the globe uh, to, uh, to, to get other countries to understand that it, it benefits all of us. Uh, it is a community of nation, uh, community of nations um, uh, issue when we can come together uh, as a community of nations and help those nations that have been afflicted with the uh, with these uh, mines, abandoned mines, and unexploded ordinances. I mean, you, you know, it's only been since. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, countries have always used mining. Uh, we see that all the way back, uh, World War One, World War Two, but it took on a new level. Uh, uh, in recent conflicts over the last uh, 20, 30 years with IEDs and, uh, and, and, and the ability to, uh, to quickly uh, build and deploy uh, uh, and hide explosive devices. Um, and, and so uh, it's taken on a new, uh, a, a new level of uh, sense of urgency. So that, that's what we can do. And that's why I think we need to we need to encourage more of our colleagues to become a, a member of this caucus so we can continue to, to advance 
uh, the, uh, uh, the concerns and, uh, and make sure that people are informed about, uh, about the work and how important funding that work is. Thank you. And then uh, D.A.S. Brown, can you just talk briefly um, about what ways do you think the reduction in uh, U.S. troops in Afghanistan uh, will impact uh, demining efforts, if at all? And any of our other panelists, feel free to chime in as well. Uh, okay, I'd like to address a couple of topics real quickly. Adding on to the Congressman's uh, topics, uh, one of the things the U.S. participates in is the Mine Action Support Group, where we get together with uh, like-minded donors from around the world to emphasize uh, the importance of the mining or humanitarian mine action uh, and conventional weapons destruction, depending on your perspective, around the world. And one of the th areas that we've focused on in the past has been on Afghanistan and bringing together specific donor conferences in the past to make sure to highlight uh, the needs of Afghanistan uh, and the work that's, on, that's ongoing there. So uh, uh, we will continue to stay plugged into that, those venues to make sure that we highlight the need and make sure that uh, other countries uh, donate uh, to these uh, great efforts. Uh, in regards to uh, troop reductions uh, in, in Afghanistan, well, the uh, humanitarian mine action program in Afghanistan, we try to do it from, as the Congressman said, from a humanitarian standpoint, uh, where we can get agreement to, from multiple sides to be able to do the work in the field. And as we build that trust, uh, uh, we have been able to, quite frankly, continue work of uh, mine action in Afghanistan in some challenging environments. Uh, and sometimes environments that result in uh, um, uh, different insurgents or, or criminals uh, taking equipment or kidnapping folks and things of that nature. But the fact that we do it on a community-based uh, environment and the local leaders have uh, respect of uh, many of these entities, they, in most cases, have been able to negotiate and discuss and get those things back and continue the work. So we're hoping as uh, we continue these negotiations and look at the troop levels in Afghanistan that we can continue to do this work uh, in these challenging environments. Uh, it will not be easy, uh, but we're committed to uh, doing as much as we can. Thanks. Thank you. And I think we have time for one more question um, for Dr. Humayun. Uh, how has COVID impacted the demining efforts in Afghanistan specifically? Uh, thanks very much. It's a very relevant question. Um, actually, um, we I can talk about uh, on behalf of Halo Trust, my own organization, when the COVID pandemic started, we actually start, started to take measures back in March last year, and we introduced very strict measures in terms of hygiene, Ooh. hand washing, spacing out people, and putting more tents uh, for the demoners accommodation, providing more transport, providing face masks, and and uh, and also isolation tents. And uh, despite this, the, the pandemic, uh, luckily we had no. Uh, well, we had 15 cases of COVID positive cases across our program, but no fatality. And uh, we this this uh, without affecting our productivity, we managed to carry on working, but with the, with the effective measures we have introduced and uh, and carried on. And at the moment, you know, work the mining is going on very well because, you know, if we did it for two reasons. First, you know, uh, it's like a life-saving operation, you know, mine clearance. And the second one is, you have to consider the livelihoods of our demining staff because you know if they don't work, they don't get paid, and it, and it's it, and it, it's a problem. So uh, luckily, COVID pandemic did not affect the sector, the mine action sector, badly. It, it affected it, but not badly, and we had no uh, fatality fatalities. Thank you. And actually, I think we have time for one more question that came in, and then we'll close it up. But does Halo? Um, uh, write down the attribution of any UXO and mines when they are found um, and destroyed? And is there a list of responsible parties for each UXO and mine uh, IED found? Um, I know it could be difficult in some Can you please elaborate a little bit more on, I didn't quite understand the question, sorry, Kate? Of course, I think the question is, does HALO keep track of what parties are responsible for laying each mine um, or for each uh, item of UXO. Um, 
And is there a list that our audience uh, can go to to kind of find uh, who's responsible for it? Yes, of course, during the, the survey, all the information is recorded. For example, who laid the mines, when, which period, all these, uh, because it's a very comprehensive non-technical survey that you know we get pages and pages of information from community members from people who laid mines who are local commanders all the information you complete and you speak with all stakeholders involved but once we do clearance then we are just a service provider we clear the land and hand over back to the community so we are not interested that who laid mines but generally if there's conflict in an area we don't clear mines. The conf there should be no conflict, and there will be all parties should be happy for mine clearance to or uh, to take place. So that's that's the key thing. And of course, we destroy everything we find, so we take them out of circulation. So that's that's the standard procedure for the mine action sector. Thank you, and um, I think we're out of time. Thank you, Congressman Johnson, and our incredible panel. Uh, Congressman, do you have any? Uh, closing words? No, I, uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Fareed and uh, uh, Ambassador Romani and, and Mr. Brown for, for joining us today. I, I think it's been a great discussion. Um, uh, I appreciate uh, everyone's interest in this very, very important issue. I, I especially want to say thanks to our Halo Trust folks and uh, uh, the work that they do. And, uh, and Kate, uh, please express my appreciation to, uh, uh, to your boss, uh, Representative Spear. And um, sorry she wasn't able to make it today. I know how being stuck in, uh, in committee, I know how difficult that can be. So uh, please, uh, please tell her that, uh, uh, yeah, I will tell her when I see her that you did a great job covering for her and, uh, and, and hopefully next time she'll be able to join us. So. Uh, with that, I think, uh, I think we'll adjourn the caucus for today, and I look forward to seeing you guys the next go around. Thank you very much, Congressman. Thank you all. And all the other panelists, Ambassador and Stan and Kate and everybody else, thank you. Great thank you very much. For the discussion.